All right, this is our next episode of True Wrestling Fan Discussions, continuing our Dark Side of the Ring review series. This is going to be Dark Side of the Ring review, Bam Bam Bigelow. I'm your host, Mike. I'm Frank. Let's get into this. This was another uh, good one. Uh, try another tragic story, unfortunately. One of my, I would say, favorites of the 80s. Uh, when I first started watching wrestling, I, I happened to tune in and I saw Bam Bam Bigelow, and I liked the fact of how how big he was and how it uh, you know, he had tremendous agility, how he can move, and the fact that he was always pretty much teaming with Hulk Hogan, which mm-hmm. they show in this as well. Uh, so let's go ahead and get into it. There's a lot to cover. They they started off the show, uh, uh, his son was going through uh, an old date book that um, Bam Bam had on his calendar from 1987 when he, uh, when he started, and it showed that how he got married on November 15th. And he couldn't go on a honeymoon because two days later he had a show in Des Moines, Iowa. Mm-hmm. So that was the vigorous uh, schedule that they had in WWF at the time. Uh, they interviewed Dana Breckenridge, which was the ex-wife of, of Bam Bam Bigelow. Um, she said, uh, "says she um, he had more. Uh, he was more excited to be a dad uh, than he was being at the main event of WrestleMania." I mean, and, and if you watch this episode, you'll you, you know they show you how he he did everything with his kids. He wanted to be, he he mentioned to her he wanted to stay home, raise the kids, and she go off to work. And so anytime he was with them, it was priceless. Um, they also interviewed uh, Rishi Bigelow, his, his daughter of Bam Bam. Unfortunately, you know she you know she said what you you know what, not unfortunate for this part, but what you saw on TV was a complete opposite at home. Mm-hmm. Uh, the unfortunate was the mm-hmm. last memory she had of a father. And they, they bring this up now and then at the end of the uh, episode as well. Uh, the memory that she remembers uh, is being two or three, uh, like I said, which is the last time she uh, saw her father. Uh, he was driving with his head slowly, you know, bob drooping up and down and, and whatnot. And, you know, it would come back up because of, of everything that he was on. And she understood that she was in danger and panicked and had him pull over to the side of the road. Um, it happened, you know, happened to, again by a diner, which you know, a police officer took her and, you know, her dad off in handcuffs. Like I said, uh, that story comes up again at the end, and I'll get to that in a little sec. Um, her mom had picked her up and said, you won't, you know, you won't see, you, know, you won't see your dad. He needs help. This is when it, it, it totally got off, you know, mm-hmm. off the rails. Uh, they, Interview Diamond Dallas Page. Uh, he was in the show a lot, which was pretty cool. He he ran a he ran a club in, in the South Jersey called Club Xanadu, which was one block away from the Stone Pony. Um, he knew Bigelow from the Jersey Shore. Uh, he had met him at this they had this club, in between place called Quack Quack, which I thought was a pretty 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 funny name. But the only other time I've heard uh, Quack Quack is on Growing Up Gotti. You ever watched Growing Up Gotti? Yes, I One saw the, that. I, I, I started watching it, and I'm like, oh, it was. It, I used to watch it. It was funny. But do you remember one of them? One of the I don't know if it was it was a friend of theirs was Quack Quack, right? He was older, right? He was like friends with the the uncle or the mother, something like that. Yeah, and then with Quack Quack, yeah. So, never been to Jersey Shore, believe it or not. I've never been to Jersey Shore. I I've yeah. been to Atlantic City once, and that's well, you know, another blockbuster story. We had a fourth <laughs> quarter meeting there. Oh, Lord Jesus. But we, Oh, yeah, yeah. Trust me, the st- I can I can go into a whole episode of the stories from that night, mm-hmm. but I won't. But yeah, I've only been there once. I never went back. You know, it, it wasn't appealing to me for coming from, mm-hmm. you know, people from New York, the five boroughs, didn't really, you know, like Jersey and vice versa. So you don't go there. So like it was nothing appealing to me. But anyway, um, he met him at 17, uh, 17. He was called even back then. He got the nickname Beast from the East. Mm-hmm. Which was pretty cool. Shane Bigelow uh, was the son of Bam Bam Bigelow. Was interviewed as well. Said uh, he was a beast in football and in wrestling. Um, he used to. Uh, they used, him and his friends used to jump off billboards with his friends onto the mattresses. So you kind of know that you know a little, a little crazy there in South Jersey. Um, they interviewed Taz. Of course, they had to bring him into this because you know these these guys were not only good friends but you know um, one of uh, Bigelow's best opponents in ECW. Uh, and then, of course, Scott Colton Bigelow is another son of his. Uh, he and uh, I, I love this story. He talked about how Bam Bam Bigelow was a bounty hunter for a short time when he was eighteen or nineteen, and he went to Mexico to pick up a kidnapped girl. And um, besides, be, you know, 
beating up, you know, bail jumpers. He did this. He, he, uh, his partner was shot and killed, and Bigelow spent six months in jail. Yeah, he they, didn't, Go ahead. they didn't even get into the full story of what happened. Like, no, it was just, it was just, you know, dribs and drabs of it. Right. He apparently gets arrested. You assume that he got arrested because of that incident where his friend got shot, but they don't, yeah, actually they don't tell get you why. It. You assume know. that, okay, they, you know, his friend gets shot and killed, that maybe they put that on him. I, again, why, why would you be in jail for six months? So I'm a, this is what they, I'm they assuming. This is what I'm assuming. Because this happened to Dog the Bounty Hunter. Remember Dog the Bounty Hunter went yes. down to Mexico to capture that fugitive? It's illegal to bounty hunt in Mexico. You can't be an American mm-hmm. and do that. So I'm assuming that maybe that's why he got arrested because he wasn't supposed to be bounty hunting down there. Exactly. I'm. A, this is just me. I'm speculating. The dog the bounty hunter, wasn't that when he was in Chihuahua, Mexico? I don't know where the hell he was in Mexico, so, but I know so he dog, got locked so up. So dog was in the city of a dog. Yeah. Well... <laughs> Remember the remember what happened? He got locked up. He yeah. gets he gets out. The lawyer tells him, just don't ever go back to Mexico. Exactly. Then they try to extradite him to bring him back. Oh my yeah. And he eventually, you know, he was all right, but he got they tried to extradite him. Anyway, yep. moving on. But in, in this in this case, Bigelow gets six months. <laughs> right. And he the judge. friends a judge allegedly. who asked him, well, allegedly. I like yeah. the story either way. They ran through the wall. Yeah. And and he yeah. said, you know, I can I want you to be my security for when right. I'm trying. You know, these drug cartel guys are on trial and, and whatnot. They're gonna and jump the. Uh, in, in they the try court. to go after the the judge. Right, right in the court. And he he gets in their way, and for that, I will uh, reduce your sentence. Right, right. Well, whether it's true or not, it's a funny it's a story, story to tell. I'm telling you, yeah, I like this story. Um, they had uh, Shane Douglas also interviewed on here. Uh, was a partner of Bam Bam Bigelow's through his wrestling mm-hmm. career. Um, he talked about, they talked about in 81, he was talking to Paige, uh, at, um, at, at a hit club about, you know, we talked to him about wrestling. Um, he wanted to go, to, he went to a wrestling school run by Larry Sharp called the, the Monster Factory. Um, of course, Dave Meltzer was on the show. Um, he said that how Bigelow lived, ate and slept at the Monster Factory pretty much for an entire year. Uh, for doing the wrestling, yeah, we had the athletic, athletic background. He wrestled in, um, mm-hmm. he wrestled in high school. They told the, they told a really funny story. His, his son told the story of what he was told when he was full. He had injured his ankle in high school, and the coach is telling him, "Hey, listen, we want you to wrestle. Uh, we need you to wrestle." And he's like, "I can't do it." And he's like, "No, just go out there and intimidate the guy." So like, he just like yelled at the at the guy he was gonna wrestle, and the kid got scared, and he won by default. That's a great story. If it's true, that's if you, tremendous. If you saw story. Bigelow come at you, I mean, yeah, because they said on. he was big, even in high school, yeah. he was big. Yeah. Oh yeah, all the all the photos they showed of him. Oh mm-hmm. yeah, he was huge. Yeah. Um, Taz had mentioned that Bigelow's agility was super impressive, which was, uh, according to his wife, um, though unfortunately this was a a double edged sword, quote unquote, where it gave wrestling business gave you life, but it also took took the life away. That's how, what she meant by a double-edged sword. Um, in 1985 at the Monster Factory, Larry Sharp uh, uh, helped come up with the name Bam Bam. Um, and, of course, the tattoo that was on his head, which I love how uh, – I think it was Taz that was talking about. If, if you – you know, anybody that's got a tattoo knows that it hurts. So for him to get it on his head, and you know this wasn't done in one sitting. This had, it was multiple times he had to go back. I got like 20-something tattoos. They hurt, and I don't have any oh, on the top of my head, and I can only imagine what that pain feels like. I've got one across my leg, yeah. and when it got over that shin, yeah, man, did I bones, feel it. So, yeah. yes. So, imagine what your scalp would feel like. Yeah. So, the tattoo on his head was the brand, pretty much, for Bigelow. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it's right, because back then, that's the one thing that caught my eye when I first yeah, it was, saw it. Yeah. was like, this guy's got a tattoo yeah. on his freaking head. Yeah. And real cool, though, I, I got to admit. They also talked about how Paul Heyman wrote various articles about Bam Bam Bigelow at the time before he went to WCW as the manager. He was a uh, a writer for a magazine. Um, when he headed to the WWF, uh, he had, it was with the full support of Vince McMahon. He made it there um, quick. Yes. Quick. And kind of like what they did with Macho Man Randy Savage, they had a manager bid war. Like yeah. who was yeah, the, yeah. Who, uh, they were they were bidding for his services mm-hmm. and when it when it when you think it's gonna be Heenan or Slick all of a sudden here comes uh, Oliver Humperdinck mm-hmm. out of nowhere oh I'm managing Bam Bam Bigelow and 
uh, what was I going to say? Right, and automatically when he gets there, he's working with Hulk Hogan. Yeah, he's in. He's 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 already the big, uh, which is not uh, going to you know getting over so well with the veterans. So I'll get to right, they made him bit. a baby face. He was going to be the second, the second baby face next to Hogan. He was going to be the the number two guy. Major push right out of the gate. He's in Survivor Series. Yes. He they didn't mention the, this. He was the sole survivor. He won that that match, right? Am I, am I no, right about that? Or? No, I, no. He, but he was the last one. He was the he last was the, guy. I'm sorry. He was the last guy on Hogan's team. On yeah. Hogan's team, which is which know? is saying a lot. Yeah, of course. And and because he was in the video. No, game. I wouldn't have expected it watching. Yes, he was also in the very and first the wife, video game. The wife mentioned how he was in the video game. I had I had mentioned that on Survivor Series. How like that's for him to just get there and be in the video game. I don't think people realize how huge of a deal that was because during the Nintendo 8 bit era. There were only a few wrestlers you could select from. It wasn't like now where there's like 50 wrestlers you could choose from. Exactly. It was only a few wrestlers, and it he was, was one of them. Yeah, and he was one of them. Yeah, you would have a, the game was based on like you could do a tournament of series of matches, and, and uh, the one that comes out with like the most victories becomes a champion and right. whatnot. It came out around Andre around that time. Yeah, you had Andre, DiBiase, Hogan, Bigelow, Hoggy a few Tonga, others. I think Hoggy Tonga yeah. Was in it. yeah, it was a pretty decent game for the time. It was actually, but yeah, bad, the man. fact that he was in it, it's pretty, it's pretty bad. Well, I, back, for, I owned back it. Then, we were like, "Oh man, this is awesome, dude!" I was so excited when I got that game. But I you mean, look I, at it now and be like, "No, I'm not gonna play it." I no, I, no. but anyway, we're a victim of the of the graphic upgrade yeah, pretty man. much over the years, unfortunately. So his wife had another uh, funny story. She said that you know how they proposed. They were watching TV, and he just happens to like give her give us something. You want to get married? Yeah, like, like all right. you, know, you 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 crazy romantic you. So, and just like that, she's like, yeah, sure. And then, of course, they got married, but couldn't go on a honeymoon because he had to go on the road yeah, again. Yeah. So, um, he wor- they were talking about how he worked 60 days in a row, which, I mean, that'll take its toll on everybody, especially somebody who's almost 400 pounds. Um, sometimes double shows, he was talking about. They, they had his recording of voices from past interviews as well during this, which I thought was cool. Um, what was I going to say? The, like I said before, the veterans weren't happy with the rookie uh, main event spot. And the biggest one was Bam Bam had told the story uh, on the pre-recorded of how he was at, uh, at MSG, Madison Square Garden, doing a show a match with Andre the Giant. And Andre pretty much kicked the crap out of him. Yeah. Choking him out, hitting him, pretty much trying to put the, the rookie in his place, they were saying. Um Andre, Andre, he, they said Andre thought he was a cocky kid and thought that you know, you know, you're too green. And unfortunately, this is pretty much his last appearance in WWF at the time. Yeah, mm-hmm. they didn't mention this, but he actually got injured. He must have his knee, and he had to have uh, surgery. Then he leaves. Yep. And, and unfortunately, yeah, the, they showed you know Hacksaw Jim Duggan coming in, you know, saving him from Andre. But who would have thought, you know, all of a sudden, bam, that, that you know. He went from that yeah, status to, to this match, and then that's it. You're done. And, you know, so he wrestled in WCW in 1988, uh, the USWA in 1989, uh, received a lucrative offer to wrestle over in Japan, mm-hmm. which he was able to wrestle for two weeks and then be home with his family for two weeks. Yeah. You can't beat that deal, man. That's oh. that's that's pretty good. Um, He returned to the WWF in 1992. Um, they talked about his, you know, they, they just bypassed everything and went straight to the main event at WrestleMania 11. Yeah. And I don't want to speak ill of WrestleMania 11 at this point. Uh, where he faced Lawrence Taylor, um, who was Lawrence Taylor was Bigelow's idol, grew up a Giants fan in Jersey. Mm-hmm. You know, he idolized Lawrence. Who did it? That was a Giants fan pretty much back then. Oh, yeah. Um, this was supposed to make him, uh, make him uh, his name bigger with the football and mainstream press. And unfortunately it didn't, but you know, and I love what his son said. His son, Scott said, no one else in the company could carry Lawrence Taylor at that show. He's probably right. Bret Hart could have. Uh, it would have been uh, a different match, but Bret Hart could have. Yeah. Bret Hart would make anybody look good. But, 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 but LT would have to come off as the heel of Bret would. Yeah, I mean, yeah, either way, but it, 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 Bam Bam Bigelow got the most out of him. The match is not bad. Considering Lawrence Taylor doesn't know how to no. wrestle, it's not bad. Bam Bam Bigelow. Just, the, top. the only reason why it's considered bad is because it was the main event. The main event, yeah. If you switch the main event and put it to Shawn Michaels and Diesel, yeah. Bigelow, Taylor, undercard, 
is fine. Yeah, that's why. Gets, the fact that they made it the main event, that's why it gets the lack. Yeah. But I, he, I said, he, he yeah. mentioned all you know, all you know, all the YouTube articles and all, everything, the videos that says it's the worst WrestleMania main event era, and he, you know, he's defending his father. I can understand it. Yeah, but don't make it the main event. If it is a good match, a decent match. Mm-hmm. The fact that, like you said, LT couldn't wrestle. Right. So. Now, Bigelow did say in a recording that if you get hurt, there's no sympathy for you. Yeah. Unfortunately. He had various he surgeries. Care. He said that was the problem with Vince. He didn't care. Unfortunately, yes. Because And, and there's always going to be somebody else to step in in your place if you can't be there. Yep. And um, he, Bigelow knew that, if you know, like I said, if he's out, somebody else would step in, and that was a no-no. So he fought through the pain. Which was one of the issues. And Meltzer comes back on and says that you know he pro- he says he probably dealt with pain with pills, which means he doesn't know he's making an accusation. He happens to be right, but the way he said it, it's not it's not proving fact. I don't, yeah, it's, man, I don't care. I don't. Care I didn't. I didn't like the way he worded it. Just you know, either either you have the fact or you don't, or just go. Oh, in my opinion, I think whatever. Um. I, I did love this one. I laughed. I had to pause it and laugh when Vince did a, when a did a spot that said uh, WWF is a drug free company, except for John, Dr. Zaharian running around giving everybody you know steroid shots and stuff. Yeah, no problem, dude. Yeah, you're drug free, dude. Your nose is growing, Vince. They uh, his wife had said they tested for marijuana and PEDs, performance enhancing drugs, but if you had a prescription, you were you were fine. You were golden. And Bigelow had the golden goose of a doctor that would prescribe him anything he wanted and in return an autograph or tickets to a show, unfortunately, you know, would would get you whatever you wanted. Um, In 1995, Bigelow left the WWF and signed with ECW. Uh, We talked about this on um, doing the In Your House episodes as well, that Bigelow left because of the click and went on to uh, work at ECW. Uh, his son thought it was too hardcore when he went there to to watch the matches. And believe me, it was something that in the 90s nobody ever really saw unless you were in Japan of what ECW was capable of doing. And ECW, man, was off the hook in the 90s, I'm going to tell you. Um, they, had a, they had a story. Um, he got His son got punched by a drunk fan, and the fan was escorted to the back Later where Bigelow on. says, and I quote, so you like to hit kids. Well, the thing was, the son went backstage and, and Bigelow deduces what happened. He got hit and he mm-hmm. says, find him. And they went yeah. to the and they brought the guy and they, back. And they brought him back. And they gave him a beat. Bigelow, Bigelow, Bigelow gave him a beat. Hell, I would have. Any father yeah. would have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I course. mean, you're going to hit my kid. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill you. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. So from this, they went to the infamous uh, Taz versus Bam Bam Bigelow mm-hmm. match for the ECW title which was epic in, in ECW. Man, I remember this match. I've seen it a hundred times. Um, this is the one where Bigelow was to send Taz literally through the ring, through a, through a trap door. And Bigelow was worried about Taz's neck. And um, it was funny because he had a, a, a tape, he had tape on his hand that if the tape cleared, his head would be fine. So, he, he was it's so dangerous, gone. man. That's so it dangerous. is, but it, have you ever that seen that? was the marker here? besides yeah. seeing it here. Did you ever see the match prior to that? Yeah, it, it was insane. Yeah, the fact that they pulled that off with nobody really, really got hurt. I mean, a couple of minor things, it's possibly, actually really stupid. I mean, it's actually really stupid when you think about it. It worked as, it was really as opposed to mankind going off the hell in a cell. That was by accident that he went off the hell in the cell. You're talking about when he went through the ring or when he got thrown off? No, when he got thrown off, that was his that doing. Was, that was stupid, too. I mean, that was the man. <laughs> Nobody said they did it. You know, they do it for the radio. <clears throat> they said they that you know yeah. they had scientists, you know, coming up with this stuff. Um, and Bigelow kept asking him, you know, the first thing he asked You're him when right, they got down right. there is, are you okay? They crawled out. Bigelow pinned him, and Bigelow became the ECW champion. What were they called in Jersey? Um, what were they calling um, ECW? The um, I mentioned the name, not W because oh, WCW that the Jersey Triad, but in ECW. Yeah, it was him, Shane Douglas. Uh man, I, I that I, I they I mentioned the name. You. I don't know if it was trifecta. I don't know what it was. Something like that. 
So they also said that if he had a gash on his head through a match, he would pretty much just super glue it and off he goes. He's done. Now, over the course of his career, I mean, this man dealt with a lot of injuries. He had spinal stenosis, crushed discs, sections of his back were fused. His son would talk about that. Hey, you could pretty much read Braille feeling down his, his father's back. Um, he, he became angry and was coherent and incoherent at home because of the pills. He had huge pill bottles that were unheard of uh, for prescriptions, 100 to 200 to even 300 in a bottle. That, that, that's a hell no. If you, you know, obviously this doctor is not managing, the, you know, he's not paying management. He's just hooking you up to get whatever he wants. And he was in denial at the time of it well, as well, uh, to the point where his, his wife called the doctor and told him, stop writing him prescriptions, stop coming over. And the doc would tell Bigelow, the warden called me to stop coming. Jesus. So she, she pretty much, she told the doctor he was a quote unquote drug dealer. I mean, she was right in a way. So, yeah. Um, his addictions got worse with, with the oxy at that point. Um, when his daughter was born, uh, he was constantly with her. He was kind of not a changed man, but just a little different, you know, despite the pain, he, you know, he took the kids everywhere, you know, hunting, the fishing, did every, everything with him, despite what he was going through. Um, by this point now, uh, Paige had brought him to WCW. Yeah. And this is where the Jersey triad came in. Mm -hmm. He was a tag champion with him with Canyon, Paige, and Bigel. I actually liked this group when Paige turned heel and they had it. I thought it was cool. Yeah, it's just that WCW was garbage by them. But it was actually Unfortunately, a yes. It was yeah. a pretty decent group. And it's just amazing how, because Paige, I mentioned, like two guys from the Jersey Shore, man, like years later, they're teaming up together. Like who would have thought two guys that exactly. met in a bar, you know, like it's wild. I and imagine if Paige had started his career like on time rather than late, how much even right. more of a career of an impact he would have been. It was, yeah. In the short time he did, he was damn impressive. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately for Bigelow, he started no showing events, which uh, was now pretty much WCW paid him to stay home. We're like, you know, he's unreliable. We're not, you know, we're not going to fire you. We'll just write yeah. out your contract. Home. They were already going under anyway. But, exactly. I mean, but he had, I mean, he had so many injuries at that point and, the but during the too. time he was in there, I mean, it wasn't bad. He he feuded with no, Goldberg. He did right. Yeah, no, he did all tag right. champion. He, he did. Right. He did pretty good. He was a little bigger though. You could tell he was like yeah. a little bigger at that point. But mm -hmm. and by this point, he's taking fifty to twenty of the pills a day. Yeah, that's what the son said. Yeah, because even she said that you know, or Paige said, you know, you take you know, you're taking five now because three's not working, and then you forget you take then the you five, and then you take you know, five more. Sad, it's man. like Drug oh my god, sad, sad, sad thing. Yes, it is. And so when going back to the story of, of his daughter uh, mentioning about the car ride, he was actually charged with endangering the welfare of a minor when, when driving his daughter and he refused to get help. So this is where the uh, they got divorced now, mm -hmm. him and Dana. He moved to Florida, got himself a, a, a drug druggy girlfriend, I guess. His son tried to, to visit him in Tampa, but was unsuccessful. When he got back, his father called him. Um, three weeks later, on January 19, 2007, Bam Bam Bigelow unfortunately passed away. Well, the sad thing was that the son said that, um, like, the, it was something like the girlfriend basically told him, like, oh, he's not available. Like, when he went down there, he was down there for spring break, but he really wanted to see his father. Came back, Bigelow calls him and kind of apologizes, him, apologizes to him, and the son goes basically goes off on him because he was so angry. And then three weeks later. And that was probably the last conversation they yeah, had, yeah. which if any, anybody that has lost a father like I have, and unfortunately my last conversation with them was, was an argument as well. And I didn't know that's going to, that's going to bother you for years. And so I know what he's going through when he, when, you know, like, the last thing I told my father was pretty much F off. I didn't say that, but uh, to my father, right. but I mean, to him yeah. and he died due to, uh, Multiple drugs were found in this system, including a toxic level of cocaine and antidepressant drugs, benzos. The old oh, deed. Yeah. And and they call she and, and I love how Dana referred to it. She said they said it was an accidental overdose. She goes, There's nothing accidental about it. You can tell she's really hurt, man. She is. And she's pissed and off. Rightfully and so. Rightfully so. I understand. I honestly thought when I saw the previews to this episode that she was going to blame the business or blame Vince or blame Heyman or blame Bischoff 
for this. She she blamed wrestling in a whole not so, you know not so much, but she kind of did. But she didn't blame the individuals running the company. So I honestly thought that's where this was going to go. But um, she said after three years of therapy, she doesn't blame him. Right. And then she signed all the, the royalties over to her kids uh, for Bam Bam Big Love. But it, uh, unfortunately, at the age of 45, dying in 2007 was real tragic. I mean, it's just a shame. This, this was a, a, a tremendous athlete, a great father, a great husband. And he, he lost, he lost the addiction for which too many, too many people have lost. Yeah. It's unfortunate. Unfortunately. All right, well, that's our episode. Please uh, let us know what you think. Like, comment, share, subscribe. We'll see you guys soon. Definitely.